Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Alice Before Alice. I am Gail Martin, Marketing Associate at Reed Tech, and I want to cover a couple of things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the conference by using the chat or Q&A feature and sending your question to host. We will be sending you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording from today's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters, Chris Holt. Chris is Vice President of Patent Analytics, LexisNexis Patent Advisor, and has over 15 years of experience as a patent attorney specializing in U.S. and foreign patents in the electrical and mechanical fields, as well as computer hardware and software inventions. He is the co-creator of Patent Advisor and co-host of the LexisNexis IP Solutions podcast, Better Patents Now. Megan McLaughlin. Megan is the product director for Patent Advisor. Previously, she worked as a patent attorney at the law firm of Nutter, McClellan, and Fish, primarily drafting and prosecuting patent applications. Megan has a BS in bioengineering from Rice and a JD from Harvard Law. She is co-host of the LexisNexis IP Solutions podcast, Better Patents Now. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's pre presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Megan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, as Gail just mentioned, Chris and I are co-hosts of a podcast called Better Patents Now. Um, every episode will give you an idea of how to use patent data to improve your practice. Um, today's webinar, Alice After Alice, it's actually an expansion of one of our podcast episodes for those of you who may already be listeners. Um, and for those of you who aren't, please take this opportunity to go to the website um, and check it out. So, and if for, no, if for no other reason, it's worth uh, going to listen to our very catchy uh, intro tune to the podcast, if I don't say so myself. Uh, and so today we're hoping to uh, keep uh, a little bit of our casual style uh, that we have in the uh, podcast. Uh, but really what we're going to cover today, let me just sort of give you the high-level view, is that in my experience as a prosecutor, especially someone that handled a lot of software applications, there was a rejection that I often uh, would see before Alice came onto the, the scene, which is sort of this argument that, hey, I'm not going to give uh, patentable weight to a particular claim limitation because it recites non-functional descriptive material. I don't think all practitioners are necessarily always aware that uh, before there was Alice, there was still a major uh, pocket of uh, resistance that was really organized. So, you know, uh, Megan's going to talk a little bit about how Alice is sort of uh, systematically applied in the patent office. And then we're going to talk about how, you know, really that is sort of a continuation of a previous trend. So let me start uh, by turning it back over to Megan here. Great. So this overview of, of Alice comes almost entirely from Bill's blog. So credit goes to Bob Sachs um, and his various co-authors for this information. Um, but I don't think uh, if there's anybody out there who doesn't know that the situation at the USPTO with respect to Alice is bad. Um, there were three cases in 2016 that gave people some hope, um, and, and that may still be that it, it may be that we just haven't had a chance to see that play out in the data yet. Um, but the fact remains that for certain art units within the 3600, you are almost certain to get an Alice rejection, um, and getting an Alice rejection still significantly decreases your chances of allowance. Allowance in some work groups, for example, 3690, which is finance, um, went down by a factor of 10 within a month of the Alice decision. Um, and even still, three years later, there's more than a 90% chance um, that an office action on a business method in that work group will have a one-on-one rejection. What's even more disturbing is that for some work groups, there are a significant number of cases being recalled from allowance. So just because you filed a notice of allowance, it doesn't even mean that you're safe from an Alice rejection. Uh, we know that this happened right after the Alice case in June of 2014, 
there was a huge set of cases that got pulled from allowance, but the fact is that in some work groups, 3620 and 3680 in particular, um, this trend appears to be occurring even to the present day. So you will get an allowance and then it will be pulled for an ALICE rejection. Um, so that's at the patent office. For those cases that actually make it to court, um, the vast majority of the ALICE rejections are upheld. Um, even in ex parte appeals in front of PTAB, only 20% of 101 rejections are being reversed right now. So the situation is still um, pretty, pretty bleak. I would say the good news is that enough time has passed since the ALICE decision to allow us to collect some data to help provide guidance on how to avoid these rejections in the future. Or at least to maximize the likelihood that you might be able to get past such a rejection, right? Right. right. So, and I didn't necessarily elegantly uh, set this up in the beginning, but let me tell you what I've done while Megan was talking. So in, in the patent advisor system, what I've done is I've gone into the tool that we call patent document search. So this is the area where we can do full text uh, searching of office actions, claims, responses, appeal documents, uh, and uh, soon other types of, of documents. But really what I've done here is I've done a search of office actions for a phrase that I've identified as non-functional descriptive. And I'm including in my search pending, abandoned, and patented cases. So what you can see in my results set is that each uh, item in this list, so you can see there are uh, lots of items numbered one, two, three, four, five is an office action that includes this language, and you can see the blip here, non-functional descriptive material. And really what I'm honing in on is a trend that I noticed before there was Alice. So here's how it would go. I would have a claim that said something like uh, transmitting a signal um, from a client to a server system uh, wherein the signal identifies the name of a customer and a preference for something, we'll say. And then the rest of the claim would go on to be receiving that signal, you know, maybe doing something uh, in relation to the things that were identified, something like that, right? So a typical uh, software uh, claim. So uh, assume that, you know, I also was being as clever as I could possibly be to put the rest of the context of that claim into the best uh, patentable subject matter context that I could, so using whatever the magic words were for the time, uh, trying to tie it to a real-world machine as much as possible, if possible. Um, but the rejection that I would often get back was along these lines. They would say, I'm not going to give patentable weight to the fact that the signal identifies the name of the customer, et cetera, because the fact that you have written on that signal, you know, the name of the customer, for example, that is non-functional descriptive material, and it doesn't give any function at all. You've just written something onto a signal that's non-functional so therefore, I'm not going to give patentable weight to the fact that the signal identifies a customer. And so therefore, all you are claiming is a client sending a signal to a server, the server, you know, doing something. Uh, and so I couldn't breathe the limitation of, of the customer element into the claim. They wouldn't allow that to happen. And, and I think the suggestion makes more sense if you look into it history. Um, so I found a very early case that I, I think may be the, the very earliest foundation for this doctrine in Ray Russell from 1931. So this established the printed matter doctrine, which is that no patentable weight shall be given to content of information recorded in a substrate. So instead of dealing with some information encoded on a signal, back in 1931 um, in, in Ray Russell, they were dealing with 
the arrangement of names in a dictionary. Um, and in that particular case, which is very short, it'll take you two minutes to read it, um, the only point of novelty apparently in the claim was the arrangement of names in the dictionary. And the court held that not to be patentable subject matter um, because, of course, the dictionary itself wasn't new. Um, and so the information being presented on that substrate would also, would also not be new. Um, so for that reason, for a while, it was called the printed matter doctrine. Maybe the name is also the time, but, but you know, I think it makes more sense when you think of it in that context. Yeah, and I think another way uh, to look at it, and you know, this is one of those things where uh, I don't know whether it's a, a real case or an example that was used, but another example that I hear of the printed matter doctrine is that you know, imagine that you have a beaker, something that you, you measure uh, fluid in, and if I write my name on the side of that beaker, uh, Chris Holt, uh, and then I put that in my claim, and that's kind of all that's in there, of course that's not going to be patentable, the fact that I've written my name on there, because, you know, there's no functional relationship of writing your name on the beaker, or perhaps writing your company name on, on the side of a beaker. So maybe the claim is like, you know, putting advertising information on the side of a beaker. You know, that to me makes sense. That's non-functional uh, information. However, let's suppose that I have a very clever system of measurement for measuring fluid inside that beaker. Uh, in that case, uh, if I've claimed it with specificity, and it, it meets the other criteria for patentability, then, you know, why not uh, have that be patentable subject matter, right? Right. And so that's how this printed matter doctrine from this two paragraph case in 1931 has evolved into, or eventually evolved into a two step test that sounds oddly familiar to me. So the first step is, you know, is it printed matter in the first place? Is it something that's written on a substrate or imprinted somehow on a substrate? And the second step is, does it have a functional or structural relation to the substrate? So should it actually be given patentable weight if there's something more? That was eerily familiar. Yeah, so, you know, it seems to me my first, my knee-jerk reaction to this rejection that was occurring pre-Alice was always that, look, if you don't give patentable weight to, you know, a method step that is like passing the name of a customer, and if you look at almost any software claim and you sort of pull that kind of information out, it truly is a fact that you're left with just a computer or you're left with something very simple for which it's easy to find prior art. So that makes it so that almost no software claims are patentable, you know? So like Alice, it was just another way to pull out a point of novelty from, or to read out a point of novelty from a claim to make it unpatentable. Uh, it certainly, it certainly seems so. But you know, as we know with the Alice case, there's sort of two questions here, right? There's sort of the legal question of what is the standard that we're applying and how are we applying it, and you know, what is the philosophical argument of whether it should be applied and what are the intricacies of it, and you know, lawyers are designed to disagree. You know, we can probably have a debate where all of us could argue both sides of that issue, right? And so the philosophical legal issue is one thing. How it's actually applied in the patent office is another thing. And so, again, anecdotally, what I've done here is I've taken this non-functional descriptive uh, phrase, and now I have filtered the result set. So Initially, there were 34,000, more than 34,000 office actions in my search just for non-functional descriptive. So that's more than 34,000 office actions where this non-functional descriptive argument was made. And this is covering everything public from 2000 on, right? Everything public from, from 2000 on in the, in the collection, and that's just office actions. Right. And so what I've done now is I've limited it to one specific examiner with whom I had a lot of experience in practice. And, you know, we have 159 office actions where this uh, rejection was brought up by this examiner. 
And it's just page after page of office actions. And I can tell you it's very interesting because um, we had a circumstance in, in my practice where we filed uh, about 12 cases all at once that had kind of similar subject matter, but, you know, we took a different uh, approach in each case. So what happened was is one of our major clients uh, acquired a company in Fargo, and we ended up driving to Fargo. We flew and then drove to Fargo, and we did this sort of audit of all the patent applications that they had never filed but they could still file. That's what the purchasing company wanted us to do. And so there was this set of 12 cases that I drafted in a very short period of time and that we filed, and lo and behold, all 12 of those cases went to the same examiner. And this is despite the fact that they were not all continuations. They had sort of random uh, approaches, but they were sort of in the same arena. So I had the privilege of having the same examiner for 12 cases, and they kind of all got picked up in a very similar time frame. But it occurred to me very quickly that, hey, wait a second, this examiner is making this non-functional descriptive argument in almost every one of my cases, or basically every one of my cases. And it really has me cornered because there's nothing I can do to sort of rebut that argument except to try to change my claim strategy, et cetera. So from that moment, I was very curious because I'm like, wouldn't it be cool someday to have a full text database where I could see how often uh, this rejection is being included in all of this person's cases. And I can sort of tell you, and I don't mean, in fact, actually, you know, it's funny, I did this search and right off the bat, so Westman, uh, Champlin, and Kelly is where uh, I used to work, so I'm pretty sure this was probably one of my cases. So this examiner, and we're not necessarily trying to uh, personally pick on this examiner, so I'm going to move her name right off the screen. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when I encountered this examiner, it was around 2009, and you can sort of see in the layout of this examiner's statistics that this examiner went from like 2008 to 2013 before they ever granted uh, the first patent, right? And so when I discovered this uh, examiner, this examiner was basically not granting uh, anything. And, you know, I really uh, felt the weight of that, right? Because all of my cases were being systematically rejected. And so what I now know, after you fast forward uh, to today, you know, I can sort of see, and there's a couple different ways that you might search this. You know, I searched for the text non-functional uh, descriptive. Um, you can put in patentable weight which is actually more inclusive. Um, sometimes the phrase patentable weight comes up in a, the context of a preamble. So like uh, some people will say, I'm not going to give patentable weight to an element that you put in the preamble unless it breathes life into the body of the claim. But more often than not, patentable weight is being brought up because of this non-functional descriptive. But what I essentially found was is that, you know, this examiner had uh, written, so if you limit the office action, so to date this examiner has written 1,175 uh, office actions. If you limit the office actions to the set that ends in 2012, so if you look at the examiner's career through 2012, it is an extremely high percentage of cases. I mean, and we're talking more than 80% easily. Um, and, and I'm not giving you an exact number because I, I didn't use a precise method. I didn't hand check every single office action, but I promise you that more than 80% of the office actions included this uh, non-functional descriptive uh, material uh, argument. And, you know, that, that was shocking to me. So basically, this examiner is doing this systematically, right? Mm -hmm. And how, how, do you, how do you sort of explain that, right? Well, and then did you say this went on until 2012? Yeah, and so... So what happened in 2012? Well, I can tell you for a fact that I figured out that my client, uh, in addition to the 12 cases I had, had a total of 61 applications assigned to this examiner. 
and that my client had filed literally, I mean, more than dozens, actually hundreds of office action responses with this examiner trying to overcome that same rejection. And so at some point, they finally sent a policy-oriented person to the patent office to sort of investigate. And I don't know necessarily that they dealt with this examiner uh, specifically, but what I do know is that lo and behold, applications began to become patented you know, soon after this, this uh, intervention took place. So that's interesting to me because what that says to me is that this particular type of rejection, unlike Alice, um, was, what was less of a patent office policy and more of an examiner specific. Well, but that's the question because what we also know is that, you know, you can look at the art units where this examiner practices, right? Mm -hmm. So we have 3681 and 3622. I mean, these are, pretty art units. these are pretty notorious art units, right? So if we look at art unit 3622, which is where this examiner works, they have a to date historical allowance rate of 8.6%. I mean, that's crazy, mm -hmm. right? And we're not talking about since Alice, we're talking about since ever. Mm -hmm. And so if you take and you search uh, non functional descriptive and you search patentable weight in 3622, what do you think we're going to find? I think you're going to find a lot. You're going to find a lot, absolutely. So this was not just. Yes, an examiner situation. This is an art unit situation, perhaps an art unit group situation where they had essentially, in my my opinion, declared themselves the gatekeepers of patentable subject matter before there was even Alice. They had decided before Alice that cases that are assigned to them through the classification process are by rule not patentable subject matter, so they were systematically applying this non-functional descriptive argument. And how many, literally, how many, let's look at how many office actions uh, uh, in this art unit, 20,000, uh, 19,376 office actions response, responses, uh, office actions, so therefore around 20,000 responses, so if you assume what, $3,000 per response? Sure. So 20000 times 3000 we're talking about serious amounts of cash, you know, basically invested into a group of examiners that have decided that de facto, practically, uh, every case that comes to them is non-functional descriptive material. So let's zoom out a little bit. So, so before, before we set up this webinar, I went ahead and I did a search for non-descriptive, um, functional in our Pathbox search tool, and I created um, an analytics dashboard that shows the statistics for every case having an office action that used these words, non-functional descriptive. So this is every case that had an office action or a response, actually, that included these words um, since, since the beginning of time. And this is what I found. So the 24,788 cases. First of all, definitely not as prevalent as Alice, even though Alice has, not, has been around for a much shorter time frame. Um, it's much more commonly used in this. Um, and the second interesting thing is that the allowance rate is, is actually a lot higher than what I'm used to seeing for cases that have an Alice rejection. Right. So maybe maybe this particular rejection at least used to be um, easier to overcome. Um, but a couple of interesting things that I noticed that make it similar to Alice, um, in particular, oops. Sorry, that was me. I want, to look, I want to look at one thing before you run past. Let's look at the filing date of these cases, right? So look, you can see the years in which the cases that were filed that included these Alice rejections. So you can see that there's this buildup of cases, you know, filed in, from 2010. And then now they're they're trickling off, right? Which is not surprising at all, right? Right. Peaked in 2014, and now people are preferentially using Alice as opposed to this rejection. Yeah. Sorry, so, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Please no, go on. Makes perfect sense. But and but what's interesting and and which correlates with that data is the distribution of this particular rejection across our units. 
it's almost identical to the distribution of ALICE rejections. So your top R units are going to be in the 30, 3680s, 3620s, and 3690s, in almost the exact same proportion. Yeah, I mean, then that is crazy to me. So if you look at Look at that, 3689, 3685, 1,768 apps, 1,397 apps, you know, down to 3622, you know, there's at least 500 applications. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the allowance rate of those units too, right, that's the historic allowance rate that's in the fourth column there. I mean, these are the usual suspects for the places where applications go to die in the patent office. So it looks like the patent office just found a replacement for this rejection. That's potentially a little bit broader. Yes. Well, I think what's scary, Megan, is that think about it because if you were systematically applying this kind of wishy-washy, non-functional descriptive, and to the extent that the courts had looked at it, they were already sort of calling that into suspicion as a test for, you know, it's sort of a de facto substitute for a patentable subject matter argument. Uh, but then lo and behold, Alice comes along, and are you not going to be just straight emboldened by that? Because that's almost like a ratification of this, of this, what I see as questionable behavior for many years prior to Alice. And one of the most frustrating and, and questionable things about this behavior is the conflation of the novelty and non-obvious requirements with patentable subject matter. So, and then it's very clear in the Allen case that the Supreme Court is conflating novelty and non-obviousness with patentable subject matter. But it stems all the way back to this doctrine. Um, so the NPEP, when discussing the doctrine of non-descriptive um, or non-functional descriptive material, actually says that the USPTO personnel need not get patentable weight to printed matter absent a new and non-obvious functional relationship between the printed matter. And the printed. Yeah, that's interesting. It echoes the language, in, uh, the language in Alice echoes that almost exactly. Yeah, so I mean, there there seems to be sort of this path from one to the other. But again, there's two separate issues here, right? There's the legal argument, and there's sort of the evolution of this uh, printed subject matter doctrine and on into Alice. But then what's really, to me, very, very more frightening, perhaps, is sort of how this is being executed systematically in the patent office. Because it sure looks to me that classification is being utilized as a mechanism for determining whether a case contains patentable subject matter, right? Right. Because, and I, I guess to be fair, we haven't gone through the claim of all of the cases in these uh, art units and in these areas of the patent office where the allowance rate is so uh, low and where it has been even long before Alice. But I can tell you anecdotally at least that the cases that I had were not traditional business method cases. They were in the nature of CRM, customer relationship management cases. So this is not a case where uh, we were claiming a method of selecting advertisements for display next to a video, right? These were not those kinds of things. These were things that were more along the lines of things that are patented now like every day. So I can't tell you for sure because I have not examined the claims of every single one of these cases, but I can almost guarantee you that it's true that you will see a, a broad variety of claims and not just traditional business method cases. With this particular argument. With this particular argument. Which makes sense, and especially if you look at its roots. I mean, the original case had to do with the names in the dictionary. Um, so, so it's almost in a sense that it could be used much more broadly. Hey, let's be probably than it is. Let's be brave. Let's let's pick randomly a case and see what we come up with in terms of the claims, right? We'll pick an art unit. I'll let you pick the art unit. Just 30, to prove that we're being random. Thirty six twenty five. Okay, so thirty six twenty five. So we'll filter to rough those cases. So what we're doing now is we'll, we will be looking at Art Unit 3625, where a non-functional descriptive uh, rejection uh, was made. So we will go to the applications. 
and okay, I'm going to let you you pick randomly. So notice that the filing date is relatively early. Should we do something a little later? Yeah, notice also the high number of office actions that it took to get all of these cases ultimately patented. I must pull out number here. Four, fourteen. All yes. of these are incredibly high. Yeah, if you sort by a number of office actions, look, we got 14, 11. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of long prosecution. Well, I guess it drops off. There's only 256 cases, but uh, okay. pick a case, though. Here, let's pick 10, 8, 5, 8, 3, 3, 2. And what I'm wondering is, is when we look at the claims here, whether we're going to see a traditional uh, business method patent or whether we will see something more in the nature of, um, oops, sorry, let me go back one step here. We'll look at the text of the claims. In a network computing environment, a collaboration method of the management transactions and data between carriers and shippers and the transport of goods, um, creating a carrier account, uh, a data set, shipper, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we're talking about, it looks like a client-server kind of case, right? Right. So we certainly know that uh, client-server methods are even today not categorically business methods, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's, that's what I'm telling you is that in my experience, when I was getting assigned to these art units, you know, we were talking about claims that now are patented all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting. So in a sense, Alice is in good for these types of cases. Then maybe it's deflecting attention away from them a little bit. Well, but I but I'm not so sure because uh, if Alice is being applied just as systematically, without regard to the elements of the claims, mm -hmm. because what we're saying is is that there are some areas in the patent office that because you were assigned there by classification that the examiners are assuming that you're non-patentable subject matter no matter what legal argument you make. Right. And, they're, and now they're using Alice instead of this, this old version of and, the exact same argument. And, and the, what you told us when you opened this webinar is that Alice is even more difficult to overcome, I think. Right. It is. Oh, and Alice rates drop significantly after Alice and really they haven't recovered. Yeah, so when it was non-functional descriptive material, the allowance rate was like 50% mm -hmm. in, and mostly in those same art units. But then the, the allowance rate went from 50% down oh, to okay. miserable percent. Right. So very interesting. So um, uh, I'm going to check and see if we have any questions that have come in. Uh, Gail, can you uh, tee up a question for us? Hi, yes, um, there, there's been more of a comment than a question, just looking forward to your, um, you know, what, what insight you have um, on the matter, uh, addressing that it's, it's difficult. Okay, see, yeah, so we have a comment that says, but asking the examiner to follow the Federal Circuit or MPEP is throwing uh, pearls before swine. I'll be interested in whatever insight you have. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's definitely true. I mean, I don't really know how to respond to that except to uh, uh, say certainly I expect uh, the examiners to to apply uh, apply the rule of law, right? <laughs> <laughs> how many years were you were you with that this morning, Chris? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's difficult. I also uh, I also understand the the difficulties of the patent office too, right? So to, because essentially, as we have seen with patentable subject matter, you know, every time there's a shift in the law or every time there's a, a shift in the way they decide to interpret it, there's a lot of people that that needs to be communicated to and a lot of training that has to take place, you know. And so, you know, I, I, do, not, um, I do not discount the difficulty of, of uh of doing it in such a large, complex organization, but I do think it's fair to expect the rule of law to be to be applied. Yeah, you know, the other response I have, and I'm sorry, but this is me shamelessly promoting our site. I can't help myself. Is that you're right? You know, a lot of the times examiners don't actually pay attention to federal case law, 
which is why Pathwork search is really helpful because it allows you to search for successful arguments for the particular examiner you're up against or for that examiner's supervisor or for that examiner's art unit. Um, and you can also look at ex parte appeals where um, that in containing arguments that might have been successful against these types of rejections. Um, and, and I do think it's important to look at this um, on an examiner slash art unit basis because historically and now the magic words that you use to overcome a rejection are, are going to vary by examiner. And so it really is important to do the research um, on an examiner or art unit basis. Right, and I, I think a lot of it is is that you know if you're going to make a legal argument that is going like that you can be sure it's going to fall on deaf ears, then you know perhaps you want to avoid making that argument, right? Or maybe you want to consider appeal. You know, appeal is another interesting category because one of the things that has always really surprised me is that more of these non-patentable subject matter cases didn't get. Uh, appeal. So you know what's funny is, is now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to search for uh, non-functional descriptive. Again, but in this case, I'm just going to search in the appeal document, and I'm going to look for cases that ultimately uh, were patented. And I did this search earlier, and I thought it was very interesting because if you go to that examiner that I was talking about that was sort of systematically applying non-functional descriptive, not enough applicants honestly were uh, appealing uh, the cases of that examiner. I mean, well, actually, there weren't a lot of appeals. You know, people were fighting it out in prosecution not knowing that they really didn't have any chance to overcome that, that particular rejection, right? So if more people would have appealed and more people would have pushed it onto the board, but then what you see is, is as I scroll here and you look at some of the blips, when you go into these actual appeal opinions and appeal documents, you know, that a lot of times, um, you know, the, ultimately the, the board uh, decided in favor of the examiner, but they would always try to find a way not to sort of condone the the non-functional descriptive argument if they could, right? But but there's there's a lot of opinions that you can see by by going through and actually looking at the seeing at what the board had to say about these in response to these arguments. But there, but there's a lot of ratification of of that argument from the board. But you know maybe as practitioners, if we would have known that this is sort of you know, being done systematically, that we could have put more pressure on the board. So well, there nearly isn't much light on this since there has been on the Alice case. No, which is fair because it obviously wasn't as widespread of a problem. But and it was very difficult for us at the time to see the trend of patterns from the the board right. in terms of decision making patterns. But you know, another interesting thing to note from the data is that it's not like this rejection has gone away. Certainly, it's not as prominent as it used to be. And certainly, Alice is favored over this rejection. Um, it, it speaks a little bit more broadly, but this is still something that practitioners encounter today. There are still lots of office actions being issued um, every day with this particular argument. Yeah, but it's it's definitely easier for an examiner to make the Alice argument. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've kind of uh, uh, beat the horse. Crash. Uh, dead Crash. Horse. Yep. There is another question that's come in. I forwarded it to you if you can see your um, your screen there. Sure, let me pull it up here. And uh, see if there's, if you could read it out. Okay. It would be interesting to hear the USPTO's reply to the analytics you present and the analogy you, you make. Have you, basically, have you talked to, uh, to the patent office um, you know, it's, I have brought this up uh, specifically in meetings with the patent office. There hasn't been a lot of willingness to sort of uh, discuss it. Now it's almost a, a moot point because Alice has sort of replaced this issue, right? 
And I know people have talked and are talking to the patent office about this sort of systematic application of, of the Alice rejections. But unfortunately, you know, and I at the time was thinking like, really, we as practitioners should be talking to the patent office about this systematic application of this non-functional descriptive material argument, you know, but I, I didn't have enough time really to, to uh, uh, organize before we kind of got into the Alice uh, era. And I wonder if the patent office knows just how bad it is. So, you know, as you mentioned, this may be kind of a moot point because the Alice is, is such a bigger issue, but I wonder if the patent office knows how many examiners issue Alice rejections. 100% of the time. I would, get, I, I would guess that the they're very aware of the Bilski blog, which, which documents this very well. But, you know, my opinion is, is that honestly, that the people that are, are doing this are not bad people. They're not doing it just because they hate uh, software patents. I, I, I think that they're doing it because what they believe is that a case would not land in my lap unless it's been looked at and determined to be a business method patent and, and that it doesn't uh, rise above the criteria for patentable subject matter. And because it has landed in my lap, my duty is to apply the criteria with a bias towards non-patentable subject matter, that that's sort of our job. Uh, you know, that's, that's my best guess. We, we shouldn't speak on behalf of the patent office, so all we can do is look at the evidence and speculate as to what we see, and, you know, we can't, we can't really explain it, and so we can only guess. No, I mean, I, I think the, really the best advice is just to avoid these particular arguments to begin with. You'll avoid this non-functional descriptive issue. You'll avoid the Alice issue. So how do you <laughs> – this opens another can of words. So in our – in our um, podcast, we have had an episode where we talk about how do you avoid a group of arguments, or how do you draft your case specifically with an eye on avoiding these groups of arguments? And it's, it's certainly an art, you know, because because of the data, we know what words are likely to land you in particular arguments, and so. We know that characterizing your application in a certain way will get you into one argument um, versus another. Yeah. So it's a matter of, of using big data. But we also know that it's not as simple as um, simply not drafting what you believe no. to be a business method uh, patent. It's an art, not a science. Um, but it is probably our fifth book to build the blog today. There are a couple of really good articles um, suggesting particular terms to use or not to use to avoid Alice rejection. Okay, I think uh, that kind of brings us to the end here. I want to uh, one more time remind you that if you enjoyed this today, uh, then you would probably uh, enjoy our podcast. Um, not always are we tackling such serious topics. I remember we did one episode, which was let's look at uh, my personal history of prosecution uh, and decide whether you would hire me as your patent attorney. So, you know, we cover a lot of different topics on the podcast. So you can see down there the web address, which is www.retech.com slash better dash patent dash now dash podcast. Uh, you can also do a, a web search. Uh, we're on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Uh, and so if you are either looking to put yourself to sleep early or you need something to listen to on the treadmill, uh, consider uh, listening to our weekly podcast, a new episode every week. Also, if you're interested, uh, we love to do interviews and, and host various guests. So if there's a particular topic that you want to talk about, please reach out to us and let us know. Yeah, and we also have a listener mail segment, so I'll plug that too if you want to email either of us with a question that we will answer during the listener mail segment of our podcast, happy to do it. Otherwise, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, feel free uh, to email either one of us uh, or uh, send a note to Dustin, uh, who is identified on the screen here, and Dustin will definitely uh, send along the uh, question to us and we will be happy to respond. Uh, and if you have any question about Patent Advisor, 
for the data that you saw today or anything else, uh, please feel free to uh, contact us. Thank you very much.